Um, so, so what we were trying to do today, I think, is just um, have a discussion about molecular diagnostics. Um, uh, starting by, you know, having this morning, Mary Laura talked about our current 2023 uh, updates to the recommendations. Um, and then Lee talked about our hope to progress towards incorporating, you know, potentially some molecular support after we conduct the TPP. Um, and then we had wanted some of the countries to talk to us about how molecular is used. Um, I just, I do think I was speaking to some people during the coffee break that I should point out slight and aside from molecular, the crystal VC RDT does not target the toxin gene. It targets LPS 01 and 0139 if the 0139 is included. So I just want to make sure there's no misunderstanding on that. Um, it's part of the reason the tox gene is included in some of the molecular recommendations. Um, but hopefully that's just like a, a typo, but um, just want to be clear for all the country users about that. Um, I don't know if I'm, there you go. So what I thought we would do today is quickly uh, review what we had debated over the past decade for molecular diagnostics, what our new recommendations are, and then I wanted to just have a discussion about what that means, how we take molecular diagnostics from the way it has been used in most countries in the research perspective, like we just heard from, from Uganda, to actually being a part of um, color confirmation. Um, so that was the outline that I um, already went over. Um, so when we look back, our last actual technical note was in 2017, but it has been hotly debated in every annual meeting since. Um, and we, I think one of the biggest areas is discussing conventional versus qPCR and where one fits versus the other. Um, and in 2017, we left it that we wouldn't recommend one over the other. Um, COVID has since happened and perhaps changed that landscape a bit in regards to preference, so we'll get to that. Um, we also discussed at the time some of the advanced genotyping methods from MLVA to whole genome sequencing. And at that time, we you know, recommended labs to send your specimens to for whole genome sequencing. And again, COVID has changed that landscape and in, in many ways, we're hoping to work to build genomic capacity um, in each country, especially as the equipment has become more widely dispersed. And then we also at the time talked about the shipment and storage of various sample types. I still think this is pretty in, an important area as we talked in Uganda, you talked about your spokes and your hubs and, and, and what we have to go through to get a quality specimen. Um, the job aid is on me. It is It was 90% completed in March, it's still there. But I think that what, one of the points is, is that whether we have the, um, the live sample make it to the lab as we were discussing earlier on our visit to the laboratory here, or whether we um, have a filter paper specimen, how we can um, transport them to facilitate the molecular um, um, capacities within cholera. Um, this, the, then we met again in the fall, we met in 2019, right before COVID and again, hotly debated gene targets and such, but we didn't put out a paper. And in the fall of 2021, we had a sub group meeting. I'm not sure if that's what the word is. Um, and I just put in this one slide and I think this is pretty critical to one of the points that came up, um, when Lee was talking, um, that we, 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 one didn't again recommend, um, qPCR or conventional, but we wanted to recognize that equipment, especially in the face of Ebola and then COVID is often located in viral laboratories and that it can be unavailable um, for use with bacteria or enteric laboratories. Um, and I think that's something I hope we can discuss today. Have those issues or obstacles been overcome as COVID has declined and um, this equipment is more um, broadly available um, do we um, have the machines? Can we use them for bacterial work, but the reagents aren't um, available or the training is needed? So these are some of the things that um, we hope to get to today. Um, and just quickly to re, 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 um, turn to what Mary Laura introduced earlier today, um, we have now said that 
um, culture or PCR can be used for confirmation. And um, in, in addition to that, um, in certain situations, for example, when no caller is confirmed in the area, we do ask that a sample is confirmed for toxigenicity. Um, again, that's why I pointed out the Crystal VC. Um, this is interim guidance. Um, and so um, in it, we currently recommend um, certain uh, targets based on the, um, the goal. If we're looking at species identification, we currently recommend OMW for CR group or um, identification, we target RFB or toxigenicity, we talk about CTXA. Um, and um, I think um, that is the uh, interim guidance as it stands. Um, and we can continue to discuss um, where these settings are recommended. Um, but this is the crux of what I was hoping to get to. And since we we're cutting the time short, I sort of went through the beginning of that to get to this. Um, and um, as we go from um, as we were discussing during coffee break, um, for example, in Uganda, Johns Hopkins brought conventional to um, Uganda, and they did conventional for quite some time. When they ran out of tech, they got the lamps, um, what they know of, and if not, I'll call on people. We lost briefly internet connection, sorry. So no one online is going to volunteer since they didn't hear, but maybe. I know some countries, for example, we were working in and I showed up. Categories of countries. I mean, the most richest countries in the, in the world, Gulf countries. Everything is there. I mean, this is what we have seen this morning in the lab, but uh, they have access to everything. They automatize everything. Robot lab labs in bacteriology, in, uh, in virology, everything. So we have also the second category, this emergency com complex countries, uh, where, as I said, I mean, a lot have been done by WHO and other implementing partners, but especially in virology. I can say that they, they have not only one lab in national lab virology, but we decentralize, all the country decentralize. So, but this is virology. I mean, this is flu, this is uh, arboviruses, this is, uh, and they can put everything. I mean, this is what we discussed also for yellow fever. Uh, when it comes to the bacteriology, this is the weak, weak, weak part in the uh, what they call the central public health labs. I cannot say that they have access. I mean, I can give an example. I mean, in Syria, uh, this, uh, it's so wonderful. I mean, they have one, one use the PCR for bacteriology, for cholera, for meningitis, for, but not in routine. It will be for outbreak confirmation, that's it. But they, they don't have access to routine because they have one or two PCR machines. So at, it's used, exactly. So they don't have the reagents for, PC, for, for bacteria. For cholera, molecular, no, they don't have. Uh, this is the problem. I mean, what I, I said that we, we have access to RDTs, not all the time. Uh, so they, they, ha they have access to the normal traditional bacteriology, but when it comes to like cholera, I mean, we, we uh, how, how much time, I mean, we, we, we spend to confirm, I mean, and to have anti, the anti serat for Lebanon, how much time, I mean, it was, I mean, <clears throat> we didn't have access to anti serat for two months. We don't have, you know, you have to know that in the, in the region, we don't have a local market. We depend on international market. All these countries, they depend on international market. Uh, this is the normal countries. I mean, I, I'm not uh, talking about the emergency complex country. The emergency complex country, they don't have access to any market. So they depend on WHO and other partners. So what we do is we have a hub in Dubai. So this is the WHO hub. So we uh, 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 we procure and we send to Dubai Hub, and from Dubai Hub we dispatch to these countries. I mean, you you know you have to know that some countries like Libya, Yemen, we don't have the commercial flights. I mean, we are using our uh, UNHAS uh, uh, flights. 
but this flight, I mean, for Yemen, it, it, it's taking uh, uh, a long time. I mean, um, we can send once, for, once every four months uh, the, the reagent. So you can imagine how much it's difficult. I mean, uh, yeah, this is uh, what I have to say. Oh, there it goes. And Somalia, did you want to tell us a little bit more, expand on what you were saying? Uh, for Somalia, uh, I agree with the Imam uh, Amal Barakat. Uh, yeah, we do for cholera testes in, in, in a serological type and encourager, but uh, for other uh, test analysis, we use uh, uh, BCR and uh, Sahari and uh, COVID and influenza, not cholera. Because of uh, reagents, capacity building, and, and other issues in the in national lab. And we have only one, one national lab in Somalia. Other uh, four states we uh, implemented in, in rabbit testis or uh, cholera testis. Uh. So, so do you think if the logistics and the training gap were filled that you might be able to implement some of these new um, interim, um, the guidance recommendations for PCR um, in the event, say that the specimens arrive and they're no longer viable, but you could PCR confirm them. If, if the logistics and the training happened, it could be incorporated? I'm sure if that happened, uh, we are ready. I'm sure it will happen. In, in, in all the, even in uh, some uh, other uh, regions, even not in Mogadishu only, and uh, we are uh, ready to do, to do that. There you go. Thank you. Um, that's actually really great to hear. Positive, very positive. Um, I'm going to, unless anybody else wants to speak, I'm going to keep calling on others. Kenya? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, in Kenya, currently we are, we are not doing uh, PCR for cholera. What we are using, we are using the, the gold standard method, the culture. And um, it's not because that we don't have the equipment. The equipments are there. We have a molecular lab, but most of the equipment lack um, um, equipment maintenance uh, service contract and also the reagents. So if we can have the reagents uh, and maybe a bit of um, capacity building for the staff who are there, just refresh our courses for the, for the, for the people who are working in the lab we can be able to test. In fact, in Kenya, we have a very uh, a, a good uh, genomic sequencing lab where it is possible to do sequencing, but uh, just lack of funding. Like we had planned to do genomic sequencing for the current outbreak that is had, we are having in Kenya. And we had gathered more than um, 150 samples from different sites from the country. And uh, but um, the support we were to get was withdrawn the last minute. So uh, we can be able to do that. Just the support, uh, the reagents, and uh, we, can, we, can, we can do a lot because we have the infrastructure. Thank you. So I've actually seen how good the molecular capacity is in Kenya, but what you said about the maintenance means that the machine doesn't work, right? Uh, currently, the, the equipment are not, are not working. Some were, were used, uh, were overused during the COVID uh, time and uh, because of lack of maintenance, kind of they, they broke down and uh, the repair, because there are no service contracts, so the, the repairs have not been done yet, yeah. I have one last question and then we'll go to the chat. But my question back to Kenya would be, do you think, again, if the supply chain was set up, as Gabby mentioned before, it would eventually have to be picked up by the country? Do you think it is something that could be incorporated with the Ministry of Health in Kenya for a regular um, part of cholera? 
Yeah, I think yeah, I would say yes, that uh, we have the infrastructure and we can be able to do the PCR, we can be able to do genomic sequencing, just need the for logistic purposes and we can be able to do it. Yeah, thank you. I can't see it, can you read it? We're opening it up. Somebody wanted to speak on the chat. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation uh, and the conversation around. This is Fred, WHO emergency program in the Afro region. Uh, so uh, uh, the conversation about um, uh, molecular use in the in the countries and the gaps with um, uh, the skills for use and the, the resources equipment. I think it's, um, it, it, as a region, we have been encouraging uh, countries to integrate systems rather than verticalization of uh, 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 programs or capacities. Yes, indeed, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we know uh, uh, molecular capacities were built across countries. We are encouraging countries to leverage on those capacities to build capacity for uh, bacteriology. And indeed, as uh, my colleague Amal from uh, uh, as as strongly really indicated, the biggest challenge, uh, the drawback to this will be. Uh, the issue of the supplies, and 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 we 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 faced this at the beginning of the COVID nineteen pandemic. The supplies became more available over time, but eventually we went to the uh, rapid kits. But with um, uh, uh, with cholera and bacteriology in general, there's definitely going to be the challenge of the supplies, and and we we have seen this with uh, I'm, just, I'm sorry with the rapid test kits as well. So uh, at, at the bigger level, if it, it, uh, uh, interventions, oh, okay, I'll just turn on my video. Uh, yeah. yeah, I hope you can be able to see it. It's, it's, it's quite late here. Uh, so uh, the interventions that uh, uh, Gavi and team are doing in terms of uh, uh, having investment in in, in, in diagnostics, I, I wish there was uh, really a future vision to say uh, these capacities in production of these supplies, uh, primers and whatnot, uh, can envision uh, capacity built on the continent because uh, we probably will be the region that uh, uh, has really a lot of uh, challenges. So uh, really, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that I also agree. Logistics, is, I'm, the supplies have always been a challenge, but um, continue to be. Um, are there any other country representatives in the room that wanna talk? I know someone from Cameroon is here. Uh, are you hiding from me? There she is. Uh, or DRC, uh, we went to your lab today. We um, don't want to randomly call out any people as I say country names, but <laughs> well, we'll keep going and hopefully you'll want to tell us a little bit more. So, um, so this slide is probably getting ahead of ourselves as we're yet to get to um, getting the molecular up and running as we were just discussing. But in, in thinking about some of these challenges with equipment um, and vertical versus um, uh, vertical use of supplies versus cross training versus um, logistics, what when we talk about um, the, the Gavi um, um, potential support after we do the TPP, if we think about the current recommendations, they are now, um, how do we consider um, 
implementing molecular diagnostics, perhaps in this um, period of um, in the interim. And I and I think it's just something to think about. Um, if anybody has any ideas, we can obviously discuss them. Um, the other is um, just more of a question back to uh, the audience, given the, the the logistic challenges we've been talking about, including with the RDT. Um, just where do we feel um, molecular diagnostics are going to enhance our understanding of the collar disease burden? Is it because we believe, you know, the transport of specimens is so challenging and we would really increase the number of positives by doing PCR on specimens that are not viable? Do we think it is going to help us improve our targeting of OCV to work towards elimination? Um, or is it uh, because overall bacteriology really needs to be enhanced as we've largely focused on viral pathogens. Um, these are different things I was hoping we could think about and discuss today um, um, as we think about bringing molecular um, into the cholera uh, pipeline. Um, but I will keep going so that we can get to the testing strategy um, because that, we're cutting things short. Um, today, but one big issue is conventional versus uh, qPCR. Um, and I think that we all assume in the post-COVID world that uh, qPCR machines are now more widely available than conventional PCR. Um, as we already discussed, are they available for cholera? Um, but the there are pros and cons to both, right? Conventional is significantly cheaper. Uh, and perhaps um, um, some of the reagents are more easily accessible as you don't need probes, whereas uh, um, qPCR doesn't require a gel where people may, may be nervous about um, playing with amplified product and causing cross-contamination in a lab or just in general not wanting to deal with gels. Um, then there is the issue of um, in-house versus um, commercial kits. Um, as the discussion with Gavi earlier today, Gavi will be supporting commercial kits. They need to be CE at minimum, if I'm saying that. No, not CE. No, the, the point is it need, basically needs to have a recommendation from WHO. So if WHO pre-qualification says test is good, that works. But PQ is recognized that that may take a while. So they're also willing to go with a uh, kind of a faster process called an expert review panel. Um, but the point is we would need a recommendation. One of the stipulations from the Gavi board is that it basically has to have a recommendation from a WHO expert group. And so I wanted to, again, bring these points in case anybody want to talk about the real life setting, but also to, um, um, just stimulate the discussion. Many of a uh, classical cholera people may argue that, that Q isn't as necessary given that we um, bring a specimen in and dip it in APW to culture it and therefore quantitation isn't important and we're using it for yes, no sake. So is it worth the added money um, of, of QPCR or um, uh, but a commercial kit is much more easily trainable, comes with rapid job aids. Does anyone have thoughts on this? I think I can go to the next slide, which just talks about some of the genes we target with in-house. But let me just leave it on this slide to see if anybody has thoughts on this subject. I thought people would really have opinions on this, but go ahead. We have. <laughs> we have a lot. Here we are tackling, I mean, the in-house PCR. Oh my God. I mean, in countries where uh, even with commercial kits, I mean, with the QPCR, we, we have some contaminations. So can you imagine if we are going to the conventional PCR, it would be a disaster. I'm talking about some countries. Um, and I, 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 will, I, will, I want to go back to the RDT first. I mean, because I have seen the job at, uh, for the lab for RDTs. I just want to, because I, I don't want to, to I, I want to remember everybody here, but RDTs is not for the lab in our context. RDTs is for rapid response teams. They are using RDTs in the field, right? It's not for the lab because we don't have access to the lab. So we, 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 
the, the, the RDTs is first for the uh, uh, rapid response teams, and we really need to uh, uh, include something about the waste management, uh, really the RDT in the in the field, because I didn't see it. I mean, this you, the job as you did, it's just for the RDT in the lab. So when we are using the RDT in the fields, and this is where I want to discuss the sample management system. We have a big issues in sample management system. And whenever we, are, we have the testing strategy, the testing strategy is, is in the paperwork because in the field, it's not applicable at all. And the people tomorrow, I mean, our friends from Afghanistan and, the, and Shirin also, and all these surveillance who are really uh, coordinating the, 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 the testing strategy in the field, they will tell you that it's not applicable. I mean, we, we told them, okay, so if the, if, let's say the, when the outbreak is going on, uh, based on the capacity of the RDTs, do one every 10 uh, pay, uh, suspected cases, or I don't know. So but it's never applicable first. And when it's applicable, they send the positive, uh, RDTs, it's taking a lot of time. And when it comes, it's negative. So this is where we are really having this weird uh, proportion where we are comparing the, 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 the culture versus RDTs, because we understand that they, they cannot ap uh, 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 apply the testing strategy. So this is our big issues when we are talking about handling, I mean, the outbreak management, the response. So sample management system, it's a big issue. Uh, we are here talking about RDTs. RDTs, we, we, we don't have much RDTs. I mean, we are really suffering for, with, the, with the quantities of RDTs to be used in, with the rapid response team because we don't use the rapid response team in the lab. I mean, in the, if you have the lab, we have the culture. Culture is very easy. The, what we are suffering is the uh, uh, anti-serum, the other supplies we don't have. And when we, we, we and this is where we, we, we need the, a lot of support because if we can have access to these supplies, we can stock them in Dubai Hub and we can reach out uh, 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 the, these countries very easily. My friends in Afro, he's, he, he's suffering with the same issues. I mean, if he has access to this supply, he can, they have also the hub now in Nairobi, they have three hubs now. So we can use these hubs to supply the countries. So a lot of issues, I mean, but uh, conventional in-house uh, PCR in the lab who are not, uh, uh, professional in the PCR, it's uh, it's not for our uh, context. I mean, we have seen uh, contamination with the QPCR in 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 lot of countries, including Afghanistan, uh, because these these labs don't. You, you you need to know that they are very new in PCR, even for COVID. I mean, I'm here. I'm talking about COVID, about flu, about uh, dengue. Uh, a lot of contamination, so we don't we don't go to this uh, in house only in very very the the national level when we really need them to to have because you know commercial kits they have the uh, um, the expiry dates, so this is why now we are shifting for arboviral to the in house so at least they will have primer and props and the positive control in their uh, freezer so they will be able to investigate all the outbreaks in time. Right. So I think your last point was is where I would jump back in as the counter question, right? What you said you shifted in the national lab for arbovirus to in-house because of the logistical challenges to have commercial kits, right? Um, I, yeah, I, I guess I wonder, uh, I can, I see the benefits of both. Um, just the, the cost in the supply chain for the commercial can be more challenging given the discussion you just stated. I was wondering if I can call on Dr. Salda even, who has experience with both conventional and then the more qPCR type with LAMP, but how did you guys have issues with contamination? I know the supplies came through research, so the supply chain is a different question, but conventional versus one versus the other, I mean, what are your thoughts? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 
just like uh, your last uh, comment is because it is really in a research and controlled environment, we did not really have a lot of challenges with uh, uh, contamination. But if you asked me, uh, save for the costs and uh, all the others, I find the other PCR, the lamp, very, very uh, uh, easy to use. And it, it, it really can be deployed even at uh, a mobile kind of setup. And also the competence and the training is much faster. But of course, the biggest drawback is the cost. But by and large, I think it's very agreeable. We've not had so many challenges with the, other, the conventional PCR also, simply because it is not done by everyone. It's not really widespread. It is being done a lot in the virology bit, but microbiology, not a lot. Bacteriology, not a lot. So we don't have a lot of experience to warrant enough uh, recommendation. Anybody with do you have thoughts? Yes, thank you. Uh, basically, um, both PCR is very sensitive, like uh, there is chance of contamination, but the QPCR, like we have a positive pressure room, special for, specially designed for this QPCR, you know, essay. So <clears throat> no one is allowed to go in, only the person who actually does this is allowed and mixing is done in a cabinet specially designed for this. So I don't think um, the laboratories across are, I mean, ready with this. Uh, <clears throat> one more thing, like everyone is, you know, uh, stressing on the use of RDTs, uh, but the problem of like, I my use of RDTs goes back to the early 2000, actually. I use the uh, crystal dipstick, David Sek was there in ICD DRB. So we published the paper in uh, JCM. So uh, about the diagnostic limitation to clinical diagnosis of cholera. So in that paper, I used the crystal dipstick. And I actually, before that, I tested a couple of dipsticks commercially available. One was from Korea, because we sometimes receive requests to test you know, such, I mean, uh, RDTs. So the crystal VC was very, very effective. So for that, actually, I was made kind of ambassador for the art uh, span diagnostic. They invited me and, you know, we had a lot of interaction. And before, uh, no, later on, when uh, the art, uh, span diagnostic actually was sold to Arcre then they just had something like, they also requested me to test, you know, some of the samples, but later on, I didn't get that kind of, I mean, specificity and sensitivity. So probably the WHO was uh, kind of pushing them to submit, but my team, we did the testing. Currently we are using RDTs, but unfortunately not the crystal VC. Uh, basically, the source of crystal BC is something, you know, you need to kind of take care, like, you know, which source you're using, whether the specificity and sensitivity are good enough. And we have seen that, you know, not all of the RDT positive samples give culture positivity, or if sometimes PCR is also negative. So it is always better, like the multi sector collaboration, multi-method support is important for you to be in the good side. Like, you know, if you are culturing, getting that bacteria, you need to confirm it by PCR. Maybe the, not all of the labs have the PCR. If you are doing qPCR, then you do not know whether the carb coming is basically a contamination. It's, it's, it can be an artifact. Like not all the carbs are 100% reliable. So these are the things that need to be kind of considered when you are planning which which method to be you know employed for this epi you know surveillance. Yeah, just to add uh, one or two points from what he said, uh, the WHO recommends in 2021 uh, the cholera kits, which is the laboratory and investigation kits. So basically, the uh, laboratory kits 
looks at uh, fixed kit with items uh, for laboratory analysis that includes culture and antibiotic uh, resistance testing for 100 samples. That's the standard that's used uh, by WHO. The second one is a cholera investigation kit, which in addition, it contains the RDTs. Okay, but WHO recommends that the RDT positive samples be sent to culture. That means if it is once it's positive, it has to go to uh, culture. And it uh, makes sense to have more RDTs uh, than culture uh, transport medium. Just thought I'd add to this question. Uh, yes, actually, I just was reviewing this most recently with Nadia. I think given as we revise the recommendations, we'll go back and, and revisit these kits. Um, as you're saying, um, at, they don't say anything about PCR in them either as an option. So I'm not sure exactly how we'll finalize the, the new kit. I'm only very peripherally involved, but I recognize what you're saying. I think that's a good point to be noted. Um, so I had thought that we could... Uh, talk about what some of the in-house are. Um, there's various in-house, even conventional, obviously, and then qPCRs that are being developed and are used. Um, but I'm not sure if everybody in the room has quite enough experience doing either. It sounds like at this point, but I guess, um, especially given time sake, I can um, just say that we at Hopkins are going to be evaluating a few in-house qPCRs and commercial PCRs and. These are some of the genes that different groups include, if anyone has thoughts on those. Um, I throw up there the WHO standard. Um, it came up in a discussion with someone earlier today about how um, it would be needed. Um, I think I was sitting in the back of the room and I had suggested CDC create one, um, but many viral pathogens have WHO standards that allow in-house assays to be held to a certain standard of performance. Um, and then these were just some of the commercial kits that have been being talked about for some time. Life River, I think, was one of the first ones I heard of. Um, and I just didn't know if anybody in the room has had experience with commercial qPCR kits and wanted to talk at all to them, to their ease, to their cost, to the level of training needed. But I have a feeling that we're not quite there yet, maybe by next year. Anybody? Nobody? Um, okay, well, then we'll just go ahead and make some executive decisions there on which ones we try. What about, does anybody um, in this room, I realize that we're caller experts, but were you perhaps pulled, like I know many CDC people were, into, say, COVID and helping in those arenas and those commercial kits? I mean, I think we don't have uh, people here who would from the, the lab, I mean, a lot of, uh, I mean, evaluation have been done and these kits are used a lot. I mean, with, with all the, the labs, I mean, in the, everywhere. So uh, we can connect, we can gather the information. I mean, we can really, I mean, and the PulseNet, I mean, where is PulseNet people? I mean, you are using this kind of <laughs> with our labs. A couple of things that I can add. Um, for the light river kit, okay, okay. So for the life river kit, I do know of a colleague that did a validation of the kit because it was the confirmatory test in a study that is being planned. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of detail on hand about how they went about that validation. I'm happy to reach out to them to find out more information. Um, yes, at CDC, the cholera people did get pulled into COVID. Um, but what we did is a little different from what I think we need here. We want to, here we need to validate a commercial kit to be widely used. In our, in what we needed to do was validate the whole test system to report out results for clinicians. So it's a little different. We're subject to certain federal regulations. So we did our validation for that sort of um, uh, purpose. And it's, it's, it's rigorous, but I just don't know how well those, those will line up. There could be some differences and these differences could 
uh, be significant and would need to be addressed. Um, I don't know how helpful that was, Amanda. There it goes. Um, I, the only reason I made that reference was wondering if others in the room had been pulled into doing QPCR in their labs and how um, easily it was implemented and how we could consider that here in the world of cholera. I can say, I'll, and I'll stop after this. It was easy, but we have experience with QPCR. So you have to think about that when you are doing your training. Are you training someone that has experience with molecular methods? Or are you training a laboratory that has no experience with molecular methods? So it, 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 you know, there's a, there's a, that will significantly alter the amount of time spent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I fully agree with what. Yes, working now. Yeah, I fully agree with what you said. I mean, it it's a big difference between using the QPCR because when we expanded for COVID, it was very really easy because QPCR is commercial kits. I mean, it's uh, it's very really easy. But if you if we, to to be you to be uh, I mean to use the in house, this is where it's a lot of training, and this is where we are switching to the for arboviral. But you know that we are using one of our WHO collaborative centers to send everybody there because they even don't know what is PCR. They don't know how to you to to do the mix. They don't know the uh, the basic of PCR. So this is where we are switching now to the 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 real PCR for now to understand what is the PCR because the, it's a big difference. And I fully agree. I mean, uh, now it's taking, a, uh, we started this uh, training last year. Uh, we are really ta tackling only the national people and it's really useful for them. So now they really understand what is the PCR. Actually, this microphone works, but the light is not turning on. So now it should work. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It it is much more much less technical to do the commercial kits, and like you said, to bring in in house PCR requires a full understanding of the quantitation and everything like that. Um, so um, I actually think this worked out well. I thought there'd be a little bit more debate, but I just wanted to run through what it seems like we actually have. Um, some work to do to bring molecular capacity into um, the um, area of cholera confirmation um, and testing in the public health network. Uh, looks like we are going to probably need testing, supply chains, and, and some equipment. Um, and hopefully, um, as we go through the process for the TPP and, and validation, we um, can come back and tell you guys a little bit more about how we feel of these commercial kits. Um, and I think we can go ahead and 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 there, unless others have discussion. Go ahead, Nadia. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to conclude with a few general words. Um, we're not talking about you know revolutionizing the diagnostics for cholera, right? We're not talking about testing all samples using PCR or even testing those three samples per week using C PCR. I think what the new recommendations did is what we tried to do was to open a window to new diagnostic algorithms. There are some countries out there that use other methods, Malditov, um, you know, PCR in, in certain instances, et cetera, et cetera. And there are other products coming on the market. So that first step is to be not so prescriptive about what you should do or, or should not do, uh, open to other possibilities. And then the second important item of these new recommendations is, okay, yes, we do recommend testing for um, toxigenicity, and that today um, requires PCR. 
in very few specific circumstances, right? So if uh, there is no capacity to, to, to do PCR today, hopefully um, this will change uh, in the coming years. Uh, the, that part of the requirement only applies to specific samples, and there are other ways to circumvent that that are written in the guidance, um, including partnerships with other laboratories that can do it today. Um, so yeah, just again, to avoid any scare, <laughs> there is no um, a push for PCR everywhere or anything such as that. But these discussions need to be held um, since we are moving forward with, with Gavi and, and the, the help and procurement on that end, uh, development of TPPs, et cetera. So thank you very much for all the information that you have provided. Uh, thank you so much. As we conclude this uh, session, I just had like three things that I thought would think about. One would be if we could include in this guidance an economic evaluation of the cost so that as we do all this, we can have a cost benefit analysis. I know sometimes when a test is uh, widely available, then the cost uh, goes down. So it would be very good so that countries can make the immediate and then the long term cost benefit analysis. And then number two, I'm wondering the experiences of countries with Malditov. My country has Malditov, but we don't use it routinely for cholera. So I'm wondering the what the experience is, probably something that has been going into my head, which probably should go back and try to also uh, make full use of it. And then thirdly is the possibility of gene expert in cholera diagnosis. I know it has made uh, TB very easy and I'm thinking we can borrow a leaf because for example, in my country, we have a gene expert at almost every, in a hundred sites, that's the hub. So I'm wondering if we had this and we have it for cholera and we can even probably put a few drugs for AST that are common, maybe three of them that are recommended by the GTFCC. So there's something that I thought we'd think about. Thank you. Great. I really appreciate that. Um, Supriya? And then yeah. I, I just want to second that idea for... Sorry? Sure. Um, just want to second the economic analysis. I think that could be really useful. And maybe with that also an understanding of supply chains when we do the validation. Um, and then just to say that, you know, the, the number of tests that are recommended and done has an impact on the market size and on commercial producers' willingness to produce those kits. So that is something to keep in mind when we, you know, argue for fewer tests to be done. Um, it's, it may impact uh, manufacturers' willingness to, to produce these kits. Um, and, and then just to say that if the CDC and EMRO have any data on the commercial kits, we sh uh, if they're willing to share, that would be really useful to have. Thank you. Lee? Yeah, very briefly on the Cepheid comment. So one positive, Cepheid does not have a cholera um, cartridge or gene expert. There is no cholera cartridge at this point. But as part of the um, Gabby Alliance outreach to manufacturers, uh, we've actually gotten some feedback from Cepheid that they're thinking about developing one. Um, so that, you know, it's not something on the table yet, but it could be, especially if we can get the ball rolling in terms of those TPPs. That would be awesome. Go ahead, Ken. Um, maybe as my Ugandan counterpart has talked about the Madito, uh, we're using the Madito for identification for other bacteria, but uh, it's not picking it's not picking Vibio cholera. So I don't know whether there's anyone with uh, experience on, um, on Maditov and whether maybe we require special, special license for that. Uh, maybe they can share with me. Thank you. Is that it? Any other, Marion, Marie, go ahead. For the MALDI, we're doing an internal validation uh, in our laboratories now. Uh, it includes Vibrio cholerae and other enteric, bacterial enteric pathogens. And it's early days, but the one thing we know for certain at this point is um, 
Maldi is as good as the database, your comparative database. So depending on the references that you have in there will influence your result quite a bit. So, just to comment, so Amanda, concerning the use of the multitop, uh, we also use uh, multitop in, in the lab. And um, and um, it's true that it is very dependent on the uh, database that you have to interpret the results. And for example, the system broker, which is uh, largely used, uh, does not include bibliography in the database. You have to buy in um, a specific database, uh, which is a uh, pure tox, I think. It is something that you have to pay and you have to prove that you have the capacity to work on very dangerous pathogens. So, but uh, we had developed also uh, an internal database with Rupiocolere and it works, but uh, it is also a question of uh, disponibility of the good system. But in any case, you can identify the species. That's all, not the zero group. <laughs> um. It's on. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk more during the break uh, about that. Um, I think um, if if there's no more questions, I'd love to talk about this more, you know, at the cocktail later. I obviously love talking about these logistical and sustainability and capacity building things, but let's move on to Subra.